Good morning, LMCC family. Welcome to this morning's service. Pastor E has a great message for you, but first, check out this. Lake Michigan Christian Center we're glad you're with us today for our online service before I minister the word can we just bow our heads in prayer Lord Jesus I thank you so much for this awesome summer day that God we can come before you and just receive from you and your word and God I pray that God as we as we uh, look at your scriptures today I'm asking and praying that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us today in Jesus name amen well I want to continue the series I began last week talking about how shall we then live but before we do, I want to remind us all that we're still involved in this BLESS initiative. And I, I talked about it a couple of weeks ago about how we can become more of an evangelistic people in our general orientation. And again, remember BLESS, right? The B in BLESS is bless three people in a given week, right? Uh, one of which is from our church family and two of which are disconnected or not connected to church. Uh, the second, the L in BLESS, is listen. Right? Take 20 minutes or so above and beyond your time with God every week and just listen to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and basically the, the, the point behind that is to ask God to give you an evangelistic heart for the lost, to begin to remove some of these mission killers that we deal with, like fear of man and, and fear of what we're going to say, and asking the Holy Spirit to just give us a heart for the lost. And then the E in bless is eating with three people in a given week, one of which is from our church, two of which are not from our church. Okay, so that's what we're doing this week, uh, is we're focusing on the E in bless. And again, due to COVID, I get it. Sometimes, you know, you may not be able to eat with people uh, because of COVID, but man, you can have a conversation. You can call somebody up. You can maybe talk to somebody, uh, you know, in the backyard, you know, or something like that in your house and just, just connect with somebody, just build some relationships, okay? That's the B, that's the L, and that's the E in Bless. And we're basically implementing one of these every week for the next five weeks. And we'll get to the, the, the last two in the next couple of weeks. But I want to um, encourage you to turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Romans chapter 12. Uh, and in verse 2, uh, it's a very familiar scripture, but it, it says this. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then it says, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so if you remember last week, we talked about uh, this, this concept of, of how do we live in the midst of this really, really wacky year, right? And scripture gives us some really, really good ways to do that. And Romans 12 is a great place to land. And so Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And you know, how do you renew your mind? You read the scriptures, you meditate on the Lord, you pray, you seek Him, you stay faithful in church, you stay faithful in worship, all of that. And all of that's wonderful. But for many Christians, uh, if you're like me at all, you, you wanna know, well, what does that look like? Um, what, is, what, is, what does a renewed mind actually look like in practice? And so if you jump down to verses nine through 21 of Romans 12, Paul basically gives the explanation. He actually fleshes out in practical ways uh, what a renewed mind looks like. And I, I began to talk about this last week, and I want you to look at verse 12 this morning uh, in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 12, it says this. It says, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, and be faithful in prayer. And so I want to talk about those three areas this morning as we're talking about how should we then live in this wacky year of 2020 and, and what does that look like? What does a renewed mind look like? So, so let's talk about the first aspect of what Paul, Paul talks about here. And he says we need to be joyful in hope. And hope's really, really important. Hope is critical 
for human flourishing. You, you can't live without hope. I, I remember um, the account of, of a book that came out a few years ago called, uh, I think it was 21 Minutes in Hell. And I, I realize this is a bit anecdotal, okay? But a guy had a vision of hell. And, and I remember him recounting what hell is like and why hell is hell, okay? Because besides, you know, the, the fire and the suffering and all of the anguish, one of the things he said char characterizes hell that I never ever thought about is he said when you're there, you realize there's no hope. You're not getting out. There is no escape. In other words, for all of eternity, you will never ever ever escape hell. And he said the awareness of that lack of hope of any escape. In other words, if you have a bad dream, you're like, well, gosh, I w can't wait till I wake up and I get out of this dream. Well, what he said about hell was, you know, <laughs> when you're there, and again, it's not a laughing matter, but it's, it, you know, there, there's, no, there's no escape. The, the total absence of hope is what makes hell, hell. In other words, it's a critical component for human flourishing that we have this side of eternity, okay? After, after eternity, if, if, you, if you've chosen to not walk with the Lord, right? The Bible says you'll be assigned to a devil's hell and there's no hope. So it's really, really important that we latch on to hope. And, and, and it's really important in this really, really challenging year that we're a people of hope. And the Bible says be joyful in hope. Is that as you're hoping for a breakthrough, as you're hoping for the new job, right? Or hoping for a job if you're unemployed, or hoping for healing, or hoping for a breakthrough in your family, okay? The Bible says to be, to be joyful in hope. It's a precious, precious commodity. Um, I came across an account of, of, of a doctor from Harvard, from Harvard Medical School, named Jerome Groupman, okay? And he talks about, you know, hope in, in cases of, of terminal Ill, illnesses. Of course, he treats a lot of, you know, cancer patients and different patients that are dealing with debilitating illnesses, and this is what he said. He says, looking for a sense of genuine hope, and indeed that hope was as important to them as anything that you might prescribe as a physician. In other words, along with all the medicine and all the treatments, these people, they need to have hope. If they don't have hope, all the medicine in the world isn't going to help them. And he goes on to say this in his book, The Anatomy of Hope. I think hope has been and will always be the heart of medicine and healing. We could not live without hope. Even with all the medical technology available to us, we still come back to this profound human need to believe that there is a possibility to reach a future that is better than the one in the present, okay? Now, now obviously, they're hoping for healing. They're hoping for a breakthrough, and that's really, really important. But the Bible gives us a clear definition of what hope is all about. And, and if you look in, um, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 it talks about this more clearly it says that hope is the anchor of our soul that is a biblical principle okay and doctors are discovering it and psychiatrists are discovering it when they look at patients that are prone to suicide they found out that 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 it doesn't matter what people go through it doesn't matter the tragedy it doesn't matter the trial people are far less likely to commit suicide if they have hope in something that's going to get them through that situation, okay? But the Bible says specifically that Jesus and what he has done for us, his incredible victory at the cross and his resurrection is the anchor of our soul. If you look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 and 20, it says this, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to, fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope, here it is, we have this hope as the anchor of our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered in our behalf. So I want to leave you with three aspects of hope today, okay? Because again, what does it look like to have a renewed mind? Well, what it looks like is you're joyful in the midst of difficult circumstances because you have hope in Jesus and his victory. First of all, we need to have hope in Jesus' resurrection, right? Is that we can have hope today because Jesus is not in, the, not, not in that tomb. That tomb is empty. Christ is risen and he's given us victory. And I don't know if any of you know who Rick Warren is, but he's the pastor of Saddleback Church in California, pastor of one of the largest churches in America. 
and um, he and his wife uh, went through an incredible tragedy a few years ago that their son who was prone to depression and prone to some suicidal tendencies he went through just a lot of difficulties in his life he committed suicide at the age of, of 27 years old so here's Rick Warren and his wife Kay pastors of one of the largest churches in America you're supposed to be giving other people hope you're supposed to be giving other people encouragement and they're struggling with you know personal struggle in their own life and how can they find hope and he was asked how did you get through this situation and he said the answer was Easter he said this he said you see the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus happened over three days Friday was the day of suffering of pain and agony Saturday was the day of doubt and confusion and misery but Easter that Sunday was the day of hope and joy and victory Okay, and so he goes on to say this as he applied this to his own life and their son's suicide. He said, and here's the fact of life. You will face these three days over and over and over in your lifetime. And when you do, you'll find yourself asking, as I did, three fundamental questions. Number one, what do I do in my days of pain? Number two, how do I get through my days of doubt and confusion? And number three, how do I get to the days of joy and victory? And he said, the answer is Easter. The answer is Easter. You've got to keep in mind Easter, Christian. You've got to keep in mind the empty tomb as you're going through difficult circumstances. It gives you that hope that's the anchor of your soul. Second of all, okay, it doesn't matter what the moment is. It doesn't matter what the struggle is. We need to keep our eyes on the fact that the Lord Jesus is returning, okay? It says this in Luke chapter 21, verse 28. It says, when all these things begin to take place, what things? Wars, rumors of wars, chaos, political unrest, social unrest, all kinds of upheaval going on in the world, all kinds of shaking going on. He says, when these things take place, he says, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So the more things get wacky, the more things get crazy, the more things get out of control, okay, as, as we live in these end times. Jesus said, listen, start lifting up your heads. Realize that, man, my return's coming. I am coming soon, and that should give us hope. And third of all, we need to realize that the story we're in, God's story, right, it's God's world, it's God's story, right, um, is, is more important than the cultural moment. Moments come and moments go. But his story and our place in the story and our faithfulness to be obedient to the Lord, that transcends the cultural moment. Again, as I'm recording this, there's all kinds of rioting going on in Portland, Oregon. There's all kinds of rioting going on in Kenosha, Wisconsin. There are, there are governors that are standing down and allowing all of this unrest to continue. There's a lot of chaotic things going on. And it can be real discouraging, but we need to keep our eyes on the story, God's story, above the cultural moment. What, what does that mean? We need to keep our, our eyes on the fact that Jesus is Lord. He rules over everything. It doesn't matter what's going on. Number two, we need to keep our eyes on the fact that Jesus has risen. He's not in the empty tomb. Number three, we need to keep our eyes on the fact that Jesus has placed us in the current cultural moment that we live in. We have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And fourth of all, we need to realize that Jesus will restore all things. Doesn't matter how dark it is, doesn't matter how difficult it is, He will restore all things. We need to keep our eyes on that, and that is the hope that is the anchor of our soul that gets us through these times. So secondly, in Romans 12, 12, Paul says, be patient in affliction, okay? And that word affliction in the Greek refers to distress, trouble, pressure, okay? In other words, it, it's something intense that you're going through and you're supposed to be patient in it. And you know, being patient in the best of times is difficult. But then when you're going through a difficult situation, you're believing for God for a healing, you're believing for a financial breakthrough, uh, like some in the midst of this COVID trial, you know, are believing for jobs, you know, and there's a delay. And, and the Bible says in the midst of that, be patient, okay? And what does it mean to be patient? The, the Greek word for patience here is, is the word hupomene, which means to remain under, okay? So in other words, remain under the discipline of, of that situation, even in the midst of the anxiety, even in the midst of the difficulties. Um, be, be patient, okay? And I'm thinking of that, of course, uh, many of you know that, that, that I, I like to run. I, I try to run between 25 and 30 miles a week. You may not notice it with my weight here because the problem is, along with my running, I like to eat, but I do like to run. And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in fairly decent shape, I think, for it. 
Um, but the point is there's not a day that goes by when I'm out, particularly in the summer when it's really hot and I run all year long, is that, man, it's hard sometimes. And sometimes you want to quit. Sometimes when the dew point's 75 degrees at 5 in the morning, you're going out early running and it's just so hot, everything is screaming to quit. Everything is screaming to stop. But I know that in the midst of that affliction, I need to stay under that discipline and not quit and keep running through it. Why? Because the benefits far exceed the pain if you're willing to bear up under it. In other words, my day is much more productive after I got done running. And my day is, I, I think more clearly, I, I just have a greater focus in my mind because of, of running. But, but I've learned that through the years. And it's that same, same concept of hupomene remaining under that tension, remaining under that, that, that affliction um, and realizing that every situation you go through, God doesn't waste a hurt. God doesn't waste a pain. God doesn't waste any trouble that you go through because we know from Romans 8, 28, it says that God causes all things to work together for the good of those that love him to those that are called according to his purpose. So, so if we're, we're talking about, again, what does a renewed mind look like? You're patient in affliction. You're patient in those troubles because you know God is causing all of it to be worked together for your good. And, and we also know that in the midst of afflictions, God is purifying us. I love um, this, this quote from Richard Hooker. He was an Anglican priest and theologian in the 16th century. He said that affliction is both a medicine if we sin and a preservative so that we don't sin, right? Is, is, is that's what affliction is. When we go through things, it, it causes us to rely on the Lord. Affliction causes us to look to the Lord. And I'll, I'll just say it from my own standpoint from running. I'm very humble when I go running, right? I, there's not a whole lot of pride when you're in pain and you're running, right? I, is, and I've had some really, really great quiet times and prayer times with the Lord when I've been running because I'm humble and I'm open to Him. And, I, and I, it, it causes you in the midst of that difficulty to humble yourself before Him. And that breaks us of sin. That breaks us of compromise is that God can use our pains... Uh, for a purpose to purify us and to cleanse our lives. And again, our model for this is Jesus. It says this in Hebrews chapter 12 in verses 2 and 3. It says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not go, grow weary and lose heart. Right, is that we can be patient in affliction because our model, our Savior, did the exact same thing. And if we're going to walk in His steps, if we're going to truly follow Him like He calls us to do, we've got to be patient in affliction, realizing that God can work things out. In other words, this is so different than people in the world who go through difficulties, who go through trials, who go through pains that seemingly are inexplicable and are frustrating and are maddening and they get very angry and upset because of what they're going through. But as a Christian, we can realize that God is working those things out to conform us into the image of His Son. He's shaping us. He's molding us through the difficulties and that's what helps us to become patient. I like also what James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 says. It says, Brothers, consider it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials because you know that the testing of your faith develops patience. But let patience have its perfect work so that you may be mature, perfect and complete, not lacking anything. Okay, so realizing that as you're going through these things, God is working perfection in you. God is conforming you to the image of His Son. All right, we've got to realize that. I love this account that I, I came across this morning about a, a, a famous geologist, uh, Dr. James Clark, who visited Russia right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Okay, so he's in a church with formal, former uh, persecuted Christians, Christians who had been imprisoned, Christians whose husbands had been killed because of, of uh, their faith in Jesus, all right? And th these are incredibly uh, just persecuted Christians. And he talks about the fact that there was such a joy within them that, that basically was, was forged because of the affliction. In fact, let, let me just read this account. He says, I'll never forget what I, when I looked at this congregation. It seemed like the whole congregation was sparkling. The, the old women's eyes, they were gleaming bright with tears, recalling past suffering. What, what, makes, 
what makes a gem so attractive? What makes someone who has gone through affliction for Jesus so attractive? It's the reflection. And these dear women and men were reflecting God's glory through the sufferings they endured. So realize this, Christian, if you're going through afflictions right now, you're going through difficulties right now, God is working all things for your good. And you've got to keep your eyes on that. And most importantly, keep your eyes on Jesus, who, though he despised the shame of the cross, he endured it because he realized that God was going to use him to procure the deliverance of all of mankind from sin and rebellion. And so we've got to be patient in affliction. Finally, in Romans 12, 12, Paul says, be faithful in prayer. So if we're talking about what does a renewed mind look like, one of, the, one of the things that a renewed mind looks like is that renewed minds want to pray. If, if, you, if you really want to measure how renewed your thinking is, how transformed your thinking is as a Christian, do you want to pray or do you dread praying? Do you pursue prayer or do you avoid prayer? Are you in, do you want to be involved in pray and prayer and seeking the Lord and believing God for breakthroughs in people's lives? Or is it something that is really a challenge for you? And again, I'm not saying any of this to condemn any of you. I'm saying this to encourage you and to challenge you. But, but one of the litmus tests for someone who has a renewed mind as a Christian is you desire to pray, okay? And, and it says be devoted to prayer, okay? A, another translation says that. In other words, Prayer sometimes is something you got to work at, right? It's a spiritual discipline, just like lifting weights or running or any kind of exercise, okay? At times, it can be a challenge to your soul, right? Your soul may not want to do it, but the more you engage in it, the more you engage, in other words, uh, in, in that practice, it, God works something in you and begins to change your heart and begins to change your character. And again, the proof of a renewed mind is that you want a prayer and you want to join with those in prayer, all right? And, and again, right now, what's going on in our country, it's a great time to pray. There are so much to pray for with all of the unrest going on with the continuation of COVID, whether schools should be open or not, and businesses and what's going on with the economy. And oh, by the way, I think there's an election this year. Last time I checked, I think in November, plenty to pray for, right? We need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for guidance. We need to pray for discernment. Ultimately, we need to pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in this country. We need to be a people that are a praying people. And again, something that we should check our hearts. I'll check my heart. You check yours. Are you devoted to prayer? Do you desire prayer? It's really, really important. As, as I was preparing this message, I just came, I just jotted down four areas that I think are great areas for us to be praying for. Right now in our country, there's a contrast between the, the, the principles of our founding versus this, this new form of revolution that's trying to take place in our country. I did a whole sermon on this, I think a month or two ago, and I wrote a blog about it, about the contrast between the revolution of 1776 and the revolution of 1789, the French Revolution, that tried to overturn God tried to overturn the constitutional order of France, tried to totally dismantle everything. That force is in play in our country and it's very disruptive and it's very, very destructive. We as a church need to be praying against that and praying that our America would return to the founding principles upon which our country was, was, was built. Uh, one of which is the laws of nature and nature's God and resting a foundation upon God in his ways. Second of all, something else that we can be praying for is that in, in the Western world, in America in particular, in all of the Western world, we are called a cut flower generation, right? Is that we have cut ourselves from the roots of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And we're thinking we can continue to enjoy the fruits of all of this prosperity and all of this political freedom and all of these blessings we have as Americans without any regard for the Judeo-Christian root system that brought about human dignity and, and all of the blessings that we have. We need to be praying for a restoration of the Judeo-Christian heritage. Third of all, something that I think is important is that we think as Americans we can have freedom without order. We think we can have freedom and chaos. Okay? And, and again, there, there's no order in many of these, these, these cities that are erupting and all kinds of, of, of um, rioting and things of that nature. There is a freedom without order that's trying to emerge in our country. We need to be standing against that and praying for God's order and God's rule over our country and that cooler heads prevail. Fourth of all, 
um, is that the church, okay, God's people, we need to repent of our worldliness. We need to, we need to repent of our, our, our apathy. We need to repent of our scandals. We need to repent of anything that is preventing us from firing on all cylinders in this season. What am I saying, people? I'm saying there's lots to pray for. <laughs> I'm saying that when, when Paul said, listen, be faithful in prayer, he wasn't kidding. And this is true of every generation, not just our own, but we need to be people that are doing just that. So as I conclude, church, I just wanna leave you with how should we then live in this season? We need to be a people that are truly joyful in hope, patience in affliction, faithful in prayer, right? There's much to do. We can be a joyful and hopeful people. We can be a patient people and exhibit that around others. And we need to be a people that are praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So can you join with me in doing that, church? I challenge you to be about this. My heart's desire is that for every one of us that we would embrace this and that we would live as Christians with renewed minds in this season. So let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to join together under the ministry of the Word. And my prayer is for every single one of us, Father God, that, Lord, your hand will be upon us and help us to live out Romans 12, 12, 12. God, help us to be joyful in hope. Help us to be patient in affliction and help us to be faithful in prayer. And Father God, I pray this over every single person right now and I pray a blessing over all of them in Jesus' name, amen. Church, thanks for letting me be with you today. I encourage you to forward this on to other people. Encourage them. Again, we're blessing ourselves. We're blessing others in our community. And this week, the challenge for all of us is to eat with three people this week build relationships with people, one person from our church, two people from outside of our church. Okay, can you do that? I hope you can. God bless you and we'll talk to you soon.